Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis, your host, and we do not have a new show for you this week. Uh, however, we do have a great show from way in the past. It's Calvin Parker of the Pascagoula incident. I have a story to tell about that um, that came about since this uh, show I did with him. Uh, what happened was just before our show this evening, the live stream server went down. We tried to contact them. Um, they you could only fill out a ticket. You couldn't actually make a phone call. So no one to contact. So we had no way of running a live show. And our guest, Arthur Coleman, uh, would rather have the interaction of guests, whether uh, it's chat room or phone. So we rescheduled him for May 11th. He'll be back on then. Uh, Some news about next week. I want you to make sure you get a chance to listen to that show. I have a story to tell. I have Stanton Friedman on and a story to tell about some papers and a CIA, former CIA, uh, on an estate I'm working on that are really interesting. So make sure you tune in for that. Now, getting back to what you're going to hear now with Calvin Parker. Um, He was on the show way back uh, on episode number 76. A few months went by, and I got a contact from someone that wanted to reach out to him. Well, long story short, it ended up being a daughter he had not seen for years, and uh, they're in contact. And last I knew, they were uh, speaking every single day. So it's a great story, and Calvin is a real gentleman, and uh, you will see that in this show. So I apologize for uh, the live stream being down and our guest uh, rescheduling, but don't worry. It's still a great show to listen to, and I hope you enjoy it. And it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO with Martin Willis and Michael Lauk. Please remember to visit the website, podcastufo.com. Check out the latest blogs and forums. And while you're there, don't forget to like our very active Facebook page. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. Michael Lauk will be joining us in a second. Today is podcast number 75. It's a rare interview with Calvin Parker of the Pascagoula abduction incident. I have to say I really enjoyed talking to Calvin. He's really such a nice gentleman. And uh, he really has a profound story of this abduction with uh, Charlie Hickson that happened back in October 11th, 1973. It's one of the most documented cases. So, Michael, how are you doing this week? Good. How are you? Good. But I would uh, highly recommend if uh, I, I had kidney a kidney stone this week, and, and I'm telling you, it's uh, I, I wanted to die. So if you think you're coming down with a kidney stone and there's a bridge nearby, you may want to think about jumping off of it. Sure. Uh, probably a good time to to note that you are not a doctor. That's not medical advice. Yeah, this is a medical and, advice. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, 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 yeah. He's not actually advocating suicide. Just, you know, throwing that out there. Yeah, yeah. So do you think we're covered not, legally for that? Uh, obviously, that that's all yeah. the coverage you need. But anyway, I, I wanted to uh, start talking to you now because uh, – you had something to do with our guests this week. And when I said it was a rare interview, Calvin has done very few interviews. And I want to talk about how it came about. Michael, you wrote a blog. I think it was back in July on the Pascagoula incident. And Calvin actually was searching online and he found the blog and he wrote a comment. So under that, I had his email address. I contacted him. And he said, sure, he'd be up for an interview. He doesn't like to do interviews, but he would he would be on the show. But, you know, this story gets even better because a few months ago, someone, I think, emailed you first, right, Michael? Is that right? Uh, I don't know if they emailed me first. I know they emailed both of us. Yeah. And they were looking for Calvin. Well, that ended up being a long lost relative. And they ended up connecting through the blog, actually. And uh, they speak every single day, sometimes twice a day on the phone. And it's such a great connection. You know, all the hard work you and I do in this show, if nothing else comes out of it, this has. And that makes me very happy. And I want to thank you, Michael, for writing the blog because uh, 
it's funny how one little turn can make a difference in someone's life. And um, I know I'm getting all fuzzy and warm here, but I was uh, I was really excited about this whole thing, and I was very glad after, especially after speaking to Calvin and seeing what a quality person he is, um, that this happened. It's great. Yeah, it, it is kind of um, unexpected. The things that will come out of something like this. That's right, and. I also want to talk about next week's show because we have another very rare uh, interviewee coming up, and that it's going to be like a groundbreaking interview, and that's with Colby Landrum of the Cash Landrum case. I think he's only been on UFO Hunters, and I think that's it as far as I know. Uh, well, Chris Lambright and Curtis Collins will be joining us. They investigated the case, so it's going to be Colby, Chris, and Curtis and I and I'm basically going to sit in the background and let those guys do all the talking. So that's going to be a great show next week. So, Michael, what's going on for the news? Well, uh, we have some TV news. We have some science news and, and a little bit more. But let's start with ITV lists the top U.K. UFO sightings. To help promote their new paranormal program, Mystery Map, the British ITV network has published a list of their top three U.K. UFO sightings. Rindlesham Forest, of course, tops the list and is the subject of Mystery Map's first episode. It was followed by the 1987 Ilkey Moore close encounter and 1993's RAF Cosford sighting. Learn more about the sightings through the link in our show notes. And, of course, we have links to all our stories in the show notes at podcastufo.com. Michael, of course, I've heard of Rendlesham Forest, and we've actually done a number of podcasts, and you've done a blog on that. But these other encounters, uh, are you familiar with them? I've, I've just not myself. Uh, the Ilky Moore close encounter, I was vaguely familiar with. Um, it 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 involves uh, sightings of of beings. Uh, the RAF Cosford sighting, I can't honestly say that i remember ever hearing anything about yeah never heard anything about it now well it'll be interesting this show will you actually be able to see this in the u.s do you know uh probably if you engage in internet piracy yes <laughs> i refuse to answer that that's, so, that's probably that's probably good because we've already had the lawyers in here once yeah we, we have and uh yeah i've already said enough disclaimers today well well actually there's one thing that i, I wanted to say and that was because this list did make me kind of pause for a second, despite everything that we talk about, the, despite the way uh, that, that the world is coming together. Um, actually, something I was going to mention at the end is, is, you know, this week, Saturday is the 50th anniversary of uh, Doctor Who, the British iconic science fiction television series. And they're going to uh, be simulcasting the 50th anniversary special in 70 countries. Wow. That, okay. that came out the day after JFK's assassination? Yes. Wow. Yes. The premiere episode was actually uh, uh, it sh interrupted for a few seconds by breaking news about the assassination uh, in Britain. And um, So were they behind was, the assassination? <laughs> pro Sorry. Pro prob probably not. Yeah, well. but, uh, but there's probably a conspiracy theorist out there who will – maintain that it was the brits yeah. but but it, it just seems to me that i was going to mention that show in, in in this kind of realm of of it's been seen by millions and millions of people for longer than i've been alive it's produced some some iconic aliens and if you know popular culture drives ufo sightings and such i, I want to know where are the dalek sightings you, uh mm. but all that aside, that's something if, if we want to talk about later, we can. Um, on the one hand, you have 70 people in 70 countries will be watching this show all at the same time. You know, I think that's probably a record for a non-live sporting event. But at the same time, uh, with the Internet, with all this satellite television, of the three top U you know, UK UFO sightings, I've heard of one. I'm vaguely fam familiar with another. The third, you know, was completely new to me, basically. And um, even that one that we are familiar with, we're probably familiar with because it was U.S. service personnel involved. And uh, there's 
still worlds separating us in a lot of ways on, on you know, in, in this field, on this planet. And I, that just kind of caught me off guard, you know? Wow. Can viruses survive space travel in glass armor? Scientists at the Portland State University are studying the ability of viruses to survive extreme conditions if they are coated in glass-like layer of silica. While the coating seems to allow viruses to hibernate and survive many extreme circumstances, at this point it seems that such a coating is not hardy enough to protect viruses while traveling between planets. Yeah, you always hear like they're they're checking out, you know, meteorites to see if there's any type of life like microbial life that actually made it through. And didn't they find some signs of something or did I hear about that or am I is that just uh, am I confused? There have been a few very controversial claims of evidence in meteorite shards. Nothing yeah. anybody agrees on. Right. And you wonder what kind of money they're spending, what kind of funding they're getting to do this type of research, and, and why. <laughs> uh, actually, I, in the article that we've linked to, they do address some of that because one of the very practical applications of this is that – if they can perfect the silica coating, it might be able to um, protect very fragile vaccines and, for long-term storage. Ah. So, so that could actually be a, a very real-world and practical function of this research. I, I guess I feel better because a lot of times there's you know, funding that is just wasted for silly things that don't really count for anything. So that's good. That's all I have to say. You're going to upset our massive scientist portion of, of our audience. Yeah, that's true. Sorry about that. Where are those lawyers when we need them? I know. Uh, and MUFON.com is finally getting a facelift. According to a pop-up on MUFON.com, the new international director, Jan Harzen, is planning a complete overhaul of the organization's website. Now, the website has been woefully neglected, with the top story in its news section being a commentary on ABC's 2005 Peter Jennings UFO special. Stay tuned to MUFON.com for updates, literally. We've talked about this, I think, how poor the MUFON site for an organization like that uh, is just kind of unheard of. It, it is a terrible website. Um, and and I, I'm in the interest of full disclosure, I'm not a MUFON member. I actually asked on the forums months ago, you know, for anyone to kind of convince me. Um, and I'm still, you know, email me. I, I ar argue why I should join. I, I am not terribly opposed to it. But I look at things like the website and it is, I mean, literally years out of date. Um, most of the MUFON news comes from – People on their own going out, it seems like, and doing podcasts and radio shows for, for the on the state level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the website is still advertising that, you know, MUFON's radio show is available on shortwave, which <laughs> nothing wrong with the, the radio enthusiast. I happen to have – I'm not a ham radio guy, but I happen to have more than one shortwave radio in my house. <laughs> um, but it, it's – in this day and age, you know – Put put it out as a podcast. Yeah. Get, get it. Get you know. Get it together. Move on. Um, and it's it. You know, it really makes you kind of wonder. I was like, well, where where what are they doing? What's what's my what, what would my membership fee be going to and everything? So, uh, hopefully, this is a good sign for the organization. You know, it's it's the most recognized site that there is. So it's it's about time they're doing something with this. You mentioned a minute ago about emailing you. I'm going to give out the email that uh, people can reach me at, and I'll be glad to forward it to you. It's martin at podcastufo.com. I do get a lot of email. A lot of people try to get a hold of me through the website, so they go through the contact form. But that is my email address, and I always enjoy reading email. And is that it for the news today? I have one more question, Martin. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned next week's show. We haven't talked about it yet. Next week is Thanksgiving here in the States. Uh, are we going to be following the normal schedule? Oh, yes, we will. But, Michael, enjoy your week off because the show with uh, Colby Landrum next week is going to be an extra long show. There's not going to be any news in it. It's just going to be a uh, about probably an hour-plus interview with Colby Landrum and the two researchers. So take the week off, Michael, and we'll see you the week after.
Uh, okay, I, I guess I'll console myself with pumpkin pie. All right. <laughs> All right, well, have a good one. All right, you too, and I'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Calvin Parker is coming right up. Well, I'm on the line with Calvin Parker. How are you, Calvin? Fine, thank you. Welcome to the show. And uh, you were involved in one of the, I think, one of the most historical cases of abduction, and that's the Pascagoula abduction incident. Can you tell the listening audience that is not familiar with that exactly what happened? Yes, sir. On October 11th, of 1973, a friend of mine, uh, being Charlie Hickson, and I, got off work and decided to go fishing for a little while. But while we was fishing, there's a bunch of events that happened and we were abducted <clears throat> excuse me, abducted on a UFO or what we believed to be a UFO at the time. But it was blue lights and they levitated us and took us aboard and uh did a physical examination, then turned us loose. That's and that led to a bunch of events we didn't want nobody to know. But the next day, it was all in the national media. Yeah. Do you know, was that leaked out of the sheriff's office? It was. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know Charlie uh, got calls right away. He was a foreman at the shipyard there, and he got calls right away about that. But uh, let's go a, a little into detail now. I remember hearing at first that you claimed that you had fainted, but that was only because you didn't want to talk about it. Is that right? That's exactly right. Uh, Charlie and I was talking, and I told him I didn't need to, uh, you know, I didn't need all this pressure on me and all, mm -hmm. and I didn't like the interrogation and stuff. He said, well, just, you know, tell him you passed out, and I'll do the talking. So that's pretty much the way it's been for years. Yeah, and now Charlie's gone. He passed away in 2011. And were you, that's correct. Were you friends all all? along the way? Yes, sir, we were. We were friends. Now, we never did see each other that much, but we were friends, and we would talk uh, at least two or three times a year. When this happened, at the time there was a flap going on. Had you had known that, that there was a lot of uh, UFO sightings at the time? No, sir, I had no clue of anything like that that was going on. Matter of fact, I didn't watch news back then or read a newspaper, and Mm -hmm. We pretty much just worked from daylight to dark. When you got off work, you know, you went home, ate, took a shower, and went to bed. Yeah. First, when you heard, you heard like there was sort of like a buzzing sound or something. Oh, that was later. That was when it went to le uh, went to leave. The thing we noticed first was some hazy blue light. Mm -hmm. And we were fishing. You know, it wasn't unusual for the uh, police department, the sheriff department, to have somebody pulled over. Yeah. But it, <laughs> Turned around and looked in the distance and seen some hazy blue lights, kind of like on the patrol cars down here. Yeah. And then they just kept getting closer and closer and closer, and finally we found out why. Would this happen behind you, facing away from the water? If you turned around and looked, was there like an open field there? What was what was the uh, setting like? There was a little place where uh, people would park their cars and walk down to fish, and uh, every now and then throw some trash out. And uh, it was just a little open place in there. Mm -hmm. and, and you could pretty well see everything from the bridge and the road. You know, it wasn't nothing really hidden. Yeah. Describing more into the details of the event, did you immediately feel numb where you couldn't move? I did, yes, sir. Uh, later on, uh, through medical investigations and all, there was a... Uh, kind of similar to a needle mark on my arm, like I was given some kind of a, maybe an anesthetic or something. 
Now, I never knew if Charlie had one of the same marks or not, but uh, I know I did. And it stayed there for about two weeks. Mm. You know, going back for years, uh, hearing about this, the thing I remembered mostly was about the strangeness of uh, what Charlie claims were more or less robotic. Do you have the same feeling about them? I do. And uh, for a matter of fact, there for a while, the uh, Angel Shipyard is just below where this happened. And they experiment with military craft and all. And there for a while, I really believed in the bottom of my heart that uh, maybe they was experimenting with something. And it got out of hand and they wouldn't tell us about it. But they completely, of course, the government will completely deny anything when it comes to something like that. Uh, yeah, I'd, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> uh, so in description, now, since you were awake, can you, and you actually saw these robotic-type creatures, can you describe them thoroughly to the listening audience? Yes, sir, I can. They had like a grayish-looking skin. And it didn't really have a texture to it or no feel to the touch, but it that could be when I was sedated, I might not could have felt it or nothing. But they had a skin, and to me, their head just more or less sat down on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if maybe if it was creatures, they might be like us and dress up for, uh, if they do surgery or any kind of medical procedure, you know, maybe they was protecting yourself from any diseases. Mm-hmm. So it didn't seem like any kind of living being just looking at it. And they had these like almost like carrot shaped or cones on them. And, I and, didn't see that. Oh, you didn't see that. That was Char- Charlie no, that saw no, that. I didn't. That was Charlie. Yeah. Uh huh. But you do remember the skin or whatever the outer, the outer part of them was. Yes, yeah, so it's kind of a gray wrinkled up skin. But as far as any facial features or all. Uh, Anything else other than that, I, I, I didn't see it. I don't, or if I did, I don't remember it. So Charlie describes this uh, baseball size eye type thing that came out and went down over his head and possibly all around his body and then back into the wall. Did you see anything like that yourself? Well, I didn't see no, nothing that looked like an eye or anything like that, but they did have uh, some kind of. Uh, uh, I want to say metal or metallic object, and they scanned over, you know, from my head all the way down to my feet, just with one quick scan, down and up. Hmm. But I don't remember seeing an eye. Yeah. Now, did you remember the actual part where you were uh, levitated? I do, yes, sir. We were standing out facing the river. I mean, well, that's when they put us back. But when we first seen it, we just got paralyzed. I mean, it was just like you couldn't move. And they more or less floated out of this craft. And when they touched us, we levitated up probably two foot off the ground about where they were. And it was like going up a gradual ramp when we went into the craft. Now, what was going on in your head at this time? I mean, it sounds so horrific. Well, it's really hard to explain what was going on. Um, uh, it really wasn't any fear at the time. I didn't get scared until they let us out. It was all over with. Hmm. But uh, it wasn't no fear. It was just like, you know, you was willed to go in. You was willed to get examined. And you was willed to take back out. And everything was fine as long as they was there. But wow. when they left, you know, that's when it suddenly... The fear suddenly came over me. I see. So whatever ability they had to make you totally numb, they obviously had an ability to affect you psychologically at the time as well. That's what it sounds like. Yes, sir, that's correct. And at the time that this happened, we was in my car. I had uh, bought a brand-new 1973 Randall Horney. Oh, yeah. And the uh, car on the passenger side, was facing the craft. Well, it shattered the windows in the car on that side. Now, did the sheriff's office take a look at that, and did they do any tests on that? They didn't do no test on it. They was more concerned about uh, making fools out of us. Oh, let's talk about that. Was there a lot of ridicule by them themselves, or? Absolutely not. After they 
took us in and checked us and found out. And uh, in a few minutes, they come back. They was dead serious about everything. But uh, they never ridiculed us to start with. They just questioned us. And we answered the questions just as the best of our knowledge that we could. And, of course, I played kind of passed out there, so I wouldn't have to answer that many questions, just a few. Mm -hmm. But uh, they didn't ridicule us at all. Matter of fact, afterwards, they said, well, either y'all good actors, the best actors we ever seen, or we really believe you. Hmm. Said, I don't believe y'all acting. But you mentioned a minute ago that someone was making fools out of you. Who who is that that was doing that? Uh, a lot of times when you get publicity of any kind, whether you're a movie star or whatever, paparazzi or something like that, it's about the same way here. You're well known, and uh, there's a lot of people that just enjoy making somebody feel bad or mm-hmm. terrorizing them, whatever they want to do. And mm-hmm. I've gone through that all my life, ever since this happened. Oh, I bet. It's not a whole lot, but, you know, it's a few out there. Right. <clears throat> it's a few, few fake people like that that say they've seen UFOs and rolled on them or been abducted. And, you know, I know some is legitimate. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Mm-hmm. But then there's some that just do it for the publicity or maybe the money or whatever. And that's the bunch that runs it for everybody. Yeah, there's very a lot of people don't realize this, but there's very little money to be made in uh, people claiming that they've seen UFOs oh, and are abducted. It's absolutely none to be made if you figure your time and expense off work. I know after this happened, it was probably two years before I could even go back to work because of the media. Now I did do a few talk shows uh, mm-hmm. at the time. You know, back then, talk shows didn't pay you nothing to come on. You just went on. They'd pay your expenses. And, you know, I got tired of all of it. From experience of another situation, um, I can tell you that the same thing is still happening now. They still don't pay. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so, but they, a lot of them do, do pay expenses, but sometimes they don't as well. And um, I can imagine, so it was a full two years before things really died down. Wow. It was, and it never really did die down. Let's talk about the uh, 40th anniversary that just happened last month. Um, I, You and I were in touch before that time, and all of a sudden things just broke loose. Can you talk about that? Well, the Associated Press, matter of fact, they're, they're the ones that uh, tracked me down. I was just going to do an interview with you, and... And that was it, just something simple and fast, mm-hmm. because I knew the year anniversary was coming up. And I said, well, I'll do this, and it'll calm things down, and it'll all be over with. Well, before I knew it, the Associated Press had tracked me down, and uh, they had stood out there on, on the road and sent messages by probably half a dozen people that they wanted to talk to me. And finally, on a Facebook page, they sent me a deal It said, please call. So I did, and I agreed to an interview with them. Did they come out and actually film an interview with you? Yes, sir, they did. And but you know, oh, go the ahead. strange thing about it, the news media, the local news media down here, never heard a word from them. Huh, that is strange. You'd think the, the region where this happened would be the one that would be the first to report on it. Yes, sir. But on the other uh, hand, uh, Charlie Hickson was always the one in the press. Mm-hmm. He would always do the interviews and and things like this, and I didn't have to mess with him. So they probably thought that uh, since Charlie had passed away that there was no reason to come see me because I denied plenty of interviews with him. And they was polite enough, you know, not to push the issue. Wow, that's great. But also you mentioned to me that all kinds of people were knocking on your door lately, and you had no idea how they got your address. I have no clue how my address get well with computers nowadays. Yeah. You know, things ain't like it used to be. You could get in your car and go somewhere else and nobody'd ever find you. <laughs> but nowadays with computers there's no such thing as hiding. And I've had some real whack jobs show up at the door. <laughs> and uh, I've had people that want me to autograph their heads and uh Is that right? 
Oh, yeah, stupid yeah. stuff like that. Wanted me to bless him. And that's like I told him, you know, I'm not a priest. Wow. I don't have no power that God gave me. So oh. I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not, been, I'm not I'm I'm not. not trying to. I'm not laughing. You realize I'm not laughing at you. I'm just laughing at how crazy people can be sometimes. Oh, they can get really uh, radical sometimes. Yeah. I had some guy, I don't know who he was, but he offered me ten thousand dollars to come sleep with him. I said, Well, that's not my cup of tea, buddy. Much as I need the money, I ain't gonna do that. Oh my goodness. And I, wow. Yeah. And uh just things like that. Yeah, that that's pretty bizarre. It is. Yeah. You could have taken the money and sent someone else. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh now, I, I'm sure you know who Travis Walton is. Yes, sir. Father this guy. I met Travis Walton. Yeah. I, I had a conversation with him in, in a, a while back, and he basically said that if he could turn back the clock, he really wished this had never happened to him. And is that the same type of feeling that you have? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I had at one time, you know, said to these could have been demons because if if you if, if a human being abducted you and took you through everything that uh, we had gone through, Charlie and I, and probably others that have been abducted, then you'd be in a penitentiary. And a lot of people think it's good that comes out of it and all, and it it could be later on, but it's nothing good that happens to the people on the, on that end of it. Hmm. Uh, we more or less just an experiment, I think. Yeah. That's why I said it, you know, it's not good. It could be demons. Now, I heard an interview with Charlie, and he had mentioned that some things had happened afterward. Uh, did he ever talk about that publicly? Uh, not that I know of, no, sir. There's a few things that uh, he had told me that he said that he didn't want me to ever mention, mm-hmm. regardless if it was here or there, and... You know, I respect the man enough. He was a friend, and, you know, not to never say nothing about it. Sure. I'm the type of person, when I give my word to somebody or I tell somebody something, that's, that's the way that it is. Yeah. Had you ever had any ongoing experiences yourself, or would you want to talk about that? Well, not really. I, you know, I hadn't been abducted again or anything. Uh, I think at one time in my life, I they've tried to communicate with me and, uh, or somebody has, and maybe I imagined it, maybe they did, but it was more or less in your sleep and a dream. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say if that's true or not. Speaking of that, how were your dreams after this whole thing happened? You know, they were really, uh, I really didn't think about this and I didn't let it bother me a whole lot, except for when this initially happened because it broke my whole life. You know, I was due to get married November the 5th. This is October 11th. And we was, I mean, November the 9th. We were supposed to get married, and I was had a little job, and we was going to move and set up housekeeping. Everything was really going to be nice. And then this come along and just, just about rattled everything to pieces. And it didn't only disrate my life, but it disrated my family's life. Oh, that's, that's, that's sad. That's too bad. Going back to the encounter itself, when this very first happened, I understand that you and Charlie didn't even want to talk about it to anybody, but you decided you wanted to. You first went to the air base. You're right. Originally, we wasn't going to tell nobody. We sat down and we talked, and uh, we decided that it's just best not to tell nobody. And then Charlie said, you know, we've got to tell somebody. We've got to tell some officials or something what's going on. Uh, so we called uh, Kiesler. That's who it was. Mm-hmm. We called Kiesler and talked to them, and they just blew it off. They said, well, that's a deal for the local authorities. So after that, we called the sheriff department anonymously, and uh, they talked us into uh, coming up to the sheriff department. They came out and sent a car and followed us did a sobriety test on us to make sure we could drive. And we followed them to the sheriff's department. That's where the interrogations and all started, which wasn't bad. That was really nice. 
a matter of fact, one of the deputies still worked for the sheriff's department down here that uh, we had, and, and they was extremely nice. Mm-hmm. But they was, you know, also I have to prove that it was a hoax. Absolutely, and I understand that everyone left the room, and they actually were taping your conversation. Did you, when you first heard that, did that make you upset that they did that? Well, it did when I first heard it. It it, it really did, but uh, then I got to thinking about it. All it did was just prove a point. Mm -hmm. So it, it didn't upset me that bad after I got to thinking about it. Because they actually, after they listened to the tape, they realized that you weren't hoaxing. Yes, sir. That's that's when the reality hit. And then uh, we asked them, Fred Diamond was sheriff then, and uh, we had asked them not to leak nothing out. Of course, it, it's kind of like the president. You can ask somebody not to leak nothing, but somebody <laughs> around you is going to leak stuff out. That's right. And that, that night when we went on back home, we woke up the next morning and going to work, thought it was all over with. But when we got to work, we worked at the Shaw Peter shipyard. I mean, it was thousands of reporters. And I literally mean that many. Wow. Well, we got in the gate, and they couldn't even function because it was so many people out there. So they just had to tell us to go on somewhere else. But I have to admit, they did pay us, and mm. they were good to us. Mm-hmm. And they furnished uh, an attorney, Joe Flamingo, to handle the press and everything. Wow. Now, so, the uh, next day or two, uh, Charlie, all of a sudden thought about there's a possibility that you were in touch with the radioactive uh, substance. So you went. You ended up going back to that Air Force base that first rejected you. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. That's true. And uh, I don't. I don't more. Don't think it was Charlie, but it was the uh, sheriff department, more or less. Oh, it felt like we needed to go be checked. Mm-hmm. So they loaded us up and took us to the Air Force base. And when they heard radiation, of course, everybody goes crazy. <laughs> and they had on their little uniforms and stuff like that. And they come out and checked us and gave us an examination. And then we all went in and sat down and had a uh, interrogation. And it's still minutes somewhere out. I used to have a copy of the minutes of the interrogation they gave us. First of all, did they they seem like they believed your story? And, and what type of questions did they ask you? Well, some of them, we more or less just told the whole story to them. And uh, some of them acted like they really believed us because of uh, they were local people, a lot of them that had lived here all their lives. Some of them probably knew us or knew of us especially after that. Hmm. But uh, just more or less the same questions that the press asked. They never said that anything happened, but they never denied it either. Did you ever hear from the Air Force after that? No, sir, I didn't. It was all over with after that with them. I had an eerie feeling that we was being followed there at times for a while, but that's just probably paranoia kicking in. Mm -hmm. Was Uh, there... Any time that you felt in any way threatened at all by any of their questions or actions? No, sir. Not a time. You know, and again, that's the federal government, and if you uh, if they make you feel threatened, then there's something to it. So they're, they're really trained in interrogations. Absolutely. And yeah. if we had felt threatened, then it would have been a problem for us and them, I believe. Has there been any new developments or anything since this happened? Uh, any new evidence that came forth? I know some other people claim they actually saw a sighting that evening. And some of the witnesses that were uh, real credible that had seen this happen to us or seen the craft and all was off the bridge. There was a uh, probation officer, then there was a bit, two or three business owners and a preacher that had seen all this going on, and uh, wow. they said, I I never talked to them. I only read what they said, but, but they said that they seen this, and they believed it, and it was real credible. Wow. How much time would you guess that the whole encounter took? I'm going to say at least 45 minutes. There was a Coast Guard station right across from where this was happening, but I didn't see anybody out there, but... 
I'm just guessing 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were first set out on the ground, and uh, I heard an interview with Charlie, he said that he had to slap you and try to get you back. Your arms were outstretched. Do you remember any of that sort of coming to time? Uh, yes, sir, I do. I was, uh, I, my arms just kind of froze out in front of me. Mm-hmm. And and like I say, it might be from an injection or it might be from fear. I don't know what it was from. And Charlie just kind of shook me a little bit, uh, told me to uh, wake up and get up, or let's go, or do something. And then, uh, but I do remember that, yes, sir. I know we mentioned earlier that if you could take back the clock just like Travis Walton, this would never happen. Can you describe how some things have changed in your life since this occurred? Yeah, you know, I was headed to a different path in my life than I was. Uh, I was actually going to become an attorney and stay at home and all this. And then when this happened, I had to forget about school. Uh, I had to move around a good deal because uh, people would find out who I was. And, you know, I didn't want that. I didn't want that for me or my family. And it, it just caused a lot of stress on you and your family. Right. So you basically felt that because of the ridicule situation that being a lawyer would not be a good idea? I did. And uh, I didn't feel like I could probably go into a courtroom and ever convince a jury, or anybody else of all, uh, anybody's innocence or anything. would always be that thing in the back of the mind, unless the guy that wrote was abducted by a UFO. Who can believe him? That's really sad to hear, and I'm sorry that you had to go through this and, and have to take a different turn in life because of it. There is a lot of ridicule out there, and for the real solid cases like yours, it's kind of a shame, really. It's really based on fear, and and, uh, something like this could actually be true. Yeah, but uh, over time, cases kind of proved themselves to be true. And if you didn't have the ridicule of people, you wouldn't have nothing to back it up to. And that's kind of the way I look at it now. If people didn't ridicule and... uh, there, there would be nothing to compare it to. There would be no one trying to prove it wrong. And I like the idea that people was trying to prove this wrong because something did happen. Mm-hmm. Now, regardless if it was an experiment going bad or whatever happened or aliens or something that God sent, it, that's not the point. The point is something happened. Now, I know there was a polygraph test taken and passed, and was it just one? No, I've had two, and I had a boy stress test. Ah, uh, and all passed. Every, every one of them passed, without a doubt. We were in Chicago, and um, they flew us up for the uh, Mike Douglas show. Oh, yeah. And part of going on would be uh, having to take a polygraph test. So we did. Both of us took one and passed it. Then later on uh, in life, Somebody gave me a boy stress test, and then uh, I had another polygraph test. I had went up and talked to uh, Bud Hopkins. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I met Bud Hopkins in uh, Florida. He had flew down, and he wanted to rehypnotize us and all. And that's when I got into really taking another polygraph test and stuff. So it's always been trying to prove this thing either right or wrong. Now, to me, I wouldn't care if it was proved wrong and everybody said it was a hoax and, and it go away, but it won't. Yeah. Have a lot of people tried to discredit you in this? No, sir. They haven't. Not a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, you see one every now and then. They'll call you Sputnik or something like that. But, uh, but that's mostly in um, play, I mean, construction play, because I went into the construction field a little short time after that. And these people that you work around usually are not real generous. Right. How about Philip Class? Is he, did he ever contact you? He tried, and, uh, you know, he formed his own opinion about things. Mm-hmm. And Philip Class, uh, to me, he wasn't, <laughs> he was probably a smart man, but he wasn't as smart as what he thought he was. <laughs> I agree with you there. Now, how was your treatment? from J. Allen Hynek at the time? 
when he first got there, uh, Heineck was kind of standoffish. Him and a harder had came down, but he was a little bit standoffish. And then over the times that we spent together and the questionnaires that he had and the hypnosis that they'd done and all, he, uh, he said, and he told us, he said, without a doubt, I know that something happened to y'all. I don't know what, except for what y'all said. And he said, without a doubt, there's something that happened. Right. Well, Calvin, we're, we're out of time. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we sign off? Well, just one thing. I know there's a lot of people that use this for a hoax and a lot of people trying to make like a religion. I just want people to really think things out before they get involved in something that's going to cost them money. Because it's like religion. Uh, you know, religion is one of the most powerful things in the world to make money. And I don't want to see nobody get scammed or anything. I think those are great words. Well, Thanks so much, Calvin. It's been a, a, a genuine pleasure to talk to you. You're a gentleman, and uh, I really thank you a lot for coming on the show. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. 